I run network software um, and automation at JP Morgan Chase. I'm also responsible for all of our network, external network security. Um, <clears throat> So there's going to be a, a software angle to this as well because you know, one of the things that we found is it's a lot about the tools, the network's actually quite easy, it's everything else, which I think is a common theme. So the good news, you know, in an enterprise, it's always been particularly difficult to well, start V6. You know, is it just a bunch of network engineers saying we should do it? You know, we've all been through this story. Um, at JP Morgan Chase, it's now an official project. It has been for probably a couple of years. Um, <clears throat> it has funding. It has regular updates. Uh, V6 is understood at a, a CIO level, so we're pretty happy that um, yeah, the, the noise is out there. But one of the things is you just have to keep reminding people all the time it's a thing. Um, if you don't, the, uh, the half-life is, is pretty fast. Um, outside in, so same as everyone else, um, work uh, you know, what you're presenting to the internet and deal with what's going on internally later. Um, our addressing plan is baked, although we tripped over that very early on. Uh, we put some wrong addresses in a wrong place, so you know, soon we had to do some readdressing. So we've already done V6 readdressing, which you know, hurts a little bit. Um, <clears throat> our main focus is enabling applications to test out to the internet. Um, uh, Chase.com is our retail application in the US. And it's a, it's a huge application. We get massive volumes. I'm, I don't have any stats, but um, getting them confident to be able to turn that on for that application is pretty significant. So we're working with a whole bunch of application teams to begin to uh, try their applications out to the internet. So enabling our development and QA infrastructures for uh, V6 is, is our sort of current main focus. Um, so, unsurprising, outside in, this is what it looks like. Um, a bit of reverse proxy, some DNS, very simple, same as everyone else. Um, you know, information in the headers that uh, is probably the main experience that an application developer will actually, will actually feel. They won't feel any IPv6 connections directly, uh, but they will st start to see some content in their headers and so on uh, to actually, you know, so that they, they're not completely immune from it. Um, but so far, they've been very interested. Um, they're actually pushing us now. It's, we're not pushing them. There's a couple of people saying, we want this. And we're like, wow, OK, so the, the, the tide has turned. Um, our internet peering is complete in the US. Um, I say applications are able to test. Um, and you know, our simple method at the moment is if we're testing and we have a problem, then we just uh, turn it off. But obviously, when we need to go to production, all of our uh, protection services for DDoS um, and our other filtering needs to be uh, needs to be ready for production. You know, basic, you know, good network security is still applied to all our development environments, um, but the, this higher level of uh, security is is what we're going to need there. Internally, um, we're going to avoid dual stack. We're going to go straight to V6 only. Um, What's happening with application architecture inside uh, enterprises like ours is a move to microservices and platform as a services, so things like Cloud Foundry. And what that means is that application owners don't have to worry themselves about the operating system anymore. They're literally just deploying code. My team, when they deploy code for automating the network, are deploying onto these platforms, and they really don't have to worry themselves uh, you know, about what's going on underneath. So what this does is this allows us an opportunity to enable V6 for the things that are actually driving the massive increases in volume. So container environments, uh, things like Cloud Foundry, those types of things. We can work with the platform providers rather than the application developers to enable V6. Um, there's, as a result, most of our network is, well, a lot of our new application traffic is HTTP. Um, the concept of an end-to-end -end app is, you know, well, it's not IP anymore, it's, it's HTTP. So that means there are a lot of middle boxes, there's a lot of load balancing, and as much as you know, part of my networking soul cries, um, the other part says, great, we've got an opportunity to interfere with that traffic and it allows us to have V6 on one side of the load balancer and V4 on the other. So actually, you know, it gives us a great way of controlling 
the very high volume increases in V6, which are driven by these sort of very small uh, sort of applications that have been deployed. Um, so that's currently going through design and certification. Yeah, our data center scale is huge. We're, yeah, we're, we're living in those last few IPv4 addresses. Uh, we've got some new data centers that are being built uh, right now. Those go live in a couple of years' time. And um, yeah, they're going to be live with the old data centers for a while. So yeah, we're not going to have enough addresses, especially with the adoption of these new application architectures. Um, so if any of, any of you is a cyclist or maybe a runner, um, you know, they say if it's not on Strava, Strava is a uh, social media application for sharing your, uh, your cycle ride. And uh, this is their slogan. So you know, if you went on a bike ride, you didn't put it on Strava, it might as well not have happened. And the reason for putting that up is you know, from a data perspective, if we don't have the data that represents our network, then the network might as well not be there. And that's in terms of our uh, ability to understand and operate it, uh, to secure it, to do anything to that network, we need the data that represents that network. If it's wrong, it's, it's pretty serious. So you know, what this means is, yeah, here's our data model. Uh, in the IPv4 world, yeah, it's, it's layered. It's, it was pretty s simple. So yeah, a switch port connects to another switch port. Some switch ports connect to NICs. And you can see how it builds up through the layers and you know, how the data is joined together. Um, unfortunately, things get really complex quite quickly in this sort of IP layer. So to actually record this information, it's not adding a new column to a table somewhere. Actually, it's, it's an entire new list. Our data structures just got really complex in terms of storing this information. Um, you know, I haven't even bothered to draw the, uh, you know, what happens on the far side there or how these different layers now interact. So you know, understanding that these, you know, what does the network look like Recording that information is now really hard. Scraping that out of the network, you know, should these things be associated between each other or are they independent, um, gets really difficult. And without this data model being created, an ability to populate it, an ability to deploy configurations from it, we can't deploy v6. So actually, as a very large part of our project, the, the software side of things, which the data is included, is probably one of our sort of biggest components. You know, certifying the gear and putting some IP addresses on it is actually relatively simple. Um, so, for example, we can't deploy a firewall rule without this being populated because we need to know that if that firewall rule is going between this part of the network and this part of the network, well, we need to know where to put it. Um, our cyber team won't approve it if they don't know where it's going to and from, and, and, and they use this data. So we cannot make a change without this data being populated. So, um, yeah, scraping some configurations is not good enough. So. This is where my team spend most of their time. Um, this is a lot of what 2019 will be about for us. Once you've got this, it's incredibly powerful and we, know, we understand the network. We can, you know, the other thing is that obviously this will be used to generate the statistics on you know, what our uh, migration looks like. So, sounds familiar. Uh, somebody said this, uh, Mr. Deering said this a few years ago, but you know, if you look at the picture, you know, the problem hasn't gone away. It's exactly the same as it was, I want to guess, 20 something years ago. Um, probably more than that. So yeah, it's precisely the same problem is that this, this unifying layer got really complex and it's, you know, it, it manifests itself in the data. So although, what's interesting, although we're going uh, single stack in the data center, the problem is the data is essentially dual stack in our databases to store the information. So yeah, even if you think you're going single protocol for any one piece of the network, you still have to represent all of that in you know, the, the data that you use to drive your network. Um, so next year, uh, first production application to the internet. Um, it'll be our first IPv6 only subnet in our data center. Um, and we're cu currently looking at the implications for container networking. Um, container networking is, um, is both a great thing, um, 
There is some IPv6 in container networking. There are some presentations out there I've presented before on v6 and container networking. The container networking screams v6 is the right solution, uh, but apparently application owners like v4 and NAT, so there's still work to do there. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Are there any questions for Steve? Oh, Veronica has one. Steve, I can't help it because we had these discussions in the past. So V4 only clients accessing your V6 only data center. That's not a typical NAT64 flow direction. It's the 4.6. How yeah. are you going to solve that? Um, load balances. So mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the first phase of that migration will be because we will do it for certain classes of applications. So essentially anything that's being deployed on our platform as a service environment, um, anything that's being deployed um, in our container environment, all has a load balancer in front of it. So if you look at our Cloud Foundry environment, um, the, which has been live for um, a couple of years now, uh, it, the, the uptick of that is, or the adoption of that is really significant. It's very easy to deploy applications to it. And we've noticed that our load balancing services have quadrupled in volume in the last year. So actually it's doubling every three or four months in terms of volume. So the, the consumption of those services to abstract applications and give the application owner control of directing their traffic to these small units of application uh, gives us an opportunity to say, well, let's put V6 on the back and V4 on the front. Um, so IP to IP translation. Um, that'll be something that'll come a little bit later. Mm. So it's not that dissimilar to the way that the V6, the council's website is set up. It's V6 only VPS at the back. I don't think there's any V4 configuration on it at all, is there, Pete? Pete was in the room before. So um, that, when you're on it, it's just like being in a V6 only world. Uh, the way that those of you not fortunate enough to have V6 at home or at work get to it is because there's a, a, a dual stack proxy um, that serves in front of it if you're accessing it um, via V4. Um, and not that dissimilar maybe to what um, David Stockdale um, is doing at Imperial, I think, um, with the new research file store, six petabytes of storage that they're planning to deploy V6 only internally, and everything else that talks to it within the campus can talk V6 to it, but it's not directly exposed externally. But they're managing and running it as a V6 only appliance. Is that a fair summary, David, wherever yeah. you are? So it's, it's the same sort of philosophy.